Lesson 9 for May 23-29, to Creation, Genesis as Foundation, Part 2. Sabbath afternoon, May 23. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that not only did you create us, but you recorded it in your word, that we can see your guidance, your blessing, and the hope that comes because of the second Adam. And today I'd like to pray, Lord, for people who are listening in various parts of the world, whether they're listening in Australia or Papua New Guinea, in Ghana or Kenya or Indonesia or Trinidad and Tobago or Japan or the United States and Canada or in Peru or in Germany, wherever people are listening, Lord, even in the Cape Verde Islands, I pray that you will bless each one listening. But may this lesson be one that will be imprinted in our minds, that we may know that you are the one that we can trust, because you are the one who created us. Bless us each one, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 19 and verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. This is one of my favourite verses. Let's read that again, Psalm 19 verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Many great thinkers were inspired by Scripture to explore God's created world. As a result, modern science was born. Johannes Kepler, Isaac Newton, John Ray, Robert Boyle and other early great scientists believed that their work revealed even more about the handiwork of God's creation. After the French Revolution, however, 19th century science began to move from a theistic worldview to one based on naturalism and materialism, often with no place at all for the supernatural. These philosophical ideas were popularised by Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, published in 1859. Since that time, science has increasingly distanced itself from its biblical foundation, resulting in a radical reinterpretation of the Genesis story. Does the Bible teach an antiquated, unscientific view of cosmology? Was the Bible account simply borrowed from the surrounding pagan nations? Was the Bible culturally conditioned by its place and time? Or does its inspired nature elevate us to a view of origins that is complete in its divine framework? These are some of the issues we will touch on in this week's lesson. Sunday, May 24. A flat earth? It's commonly believed that many in the ancient world thought the earth was flat. Most people, however, for a variety of good reasons, understand that the earth was round. Even to this day, though, some claim that the Bible itself taught that the earth was flat. Question, read Revelation 7, 1 and Revelation 20, verses 7 and 8. What is the context of these verses? More important, do they teach a flat earth? Revelation 7, verse 1. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. And Revelation 20, verses 7 and 8. Now, when the thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. John, the author of these texts, is writing end-time prophecy describing the four angels of heaven standing in the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds. He repeated the word four three times to tie the angels to the four compass points. In short, he's just using figurative language as we do today when we say, for example, that the sun is setting or that the wind rose from the east. 
to insist on a literal interpretation of these prophetic texts when the context indicates a figurative idea of north, south, east and west is to take these passages out of context and make them teach something that they are not teaching. After all, when Jesus said, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies in Matthew 15.19, he was not talking about human physiology or the literal human heart. He was using a figure of speech to make a moral point. Question, read Job 26 verses 7 to 10 and Isaiah 40 verses 21 to 22. What do they teach us about the nature of the earth? Job 26 beginning at verse 7. He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the water in his thick clouds, yet the clouds are not broken under it. He covers the face of his throne and spreads his cloud over it. He drew a circular horizon on the face of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness. And Isaiah 40, verses 21 and 22. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. In Job 26 verse 7, the earth is depicted as being suspended in space. He stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. The earth is a circle or sphere in Job 26.10. Isaiah 40 verse 22 states, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. So to finish today, put yourself in the position of someone who lived thousands of years ago. What evidence would you have that the earth moved? Or would you find the evidence that it stood still more convincing? Or what evidence would you find that it is flat or round? Monday, May 25. Creation in Ancient Literature Archaeologists have discovered texts from ancient Egypt and the Near East that contain primeval stories of the creation and the flood. This has caused some to wonder whether the Genesis account was borrowed from these cultures or was dependent in some way on them. But is such a thing really the case? Question, read Genesis 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 4, and then read these excerpts from the Atrahasis epic. When the gods, instead of man, did the work, bore the loads, the gods' load was great. The work too hard, the trouble too much. Let the womb goddess create offspring, and let man bear the load of the gods. Geshtui, a god who had intelligence, they slaughtered in their assembly. Nintu mixed clays with his flesh and blood. By Stephanie Daly, Myths from Mesopotamia, Creation, the Flood, Gilgamesh and others, published by Oxford University Press in 1989, pages 9, 14 and 15. What differences do you see? Let's read Genesis beginning at verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. 
and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so, and the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seeds according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So... God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the water abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was God. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Although there are similarities between the stories, for example, the first humans are made of clay, the differences are much more definite. 1. In Atrahasis, man works for the gods so that the gods can rest. In Genesis, God creates the earth and everything in it for humans as the apex of creation, and then he rests with them. In Genesis, humans also are placed in a garden and invited to commune with God and care for his creation, a concept not found in Atrahasis. 2. In Atrahasis, a minor god is killed and his blood is mixed with clay to form seven males and females. 
In Genesis, first Adam is formed, intimately by God, who breathes life into him, and woman is made later to be his helper. God didn't create Adam and Eve from the blood of a slain God. 3. There is no sign of conflict or violence in the Genesis account as found in the Atrahasa story. The biblical account is sublime in depicting an omnipotent God who provides humanity with dignified purpose in a perfect world. This radical difference has caused scholars to conclude that, in the end, these are very different creation accounts. So, to finish the day, some have argued that, through the ages, creation and flood stories were handed down, loosely based on what really had happened, hence some of the similarities, but distorted over time. In contrast, Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, revealed what had really taken place. Why does this explanation work better in accounting for the few similarities than does the idea that Moses borrowed from these pagan stories? Tuesday, May 26, Genesis versus Paganism Far from being dependent upon ancient pagan creation myths, Genesis seems to have been written in a way that refutes those myths and distances God as creator from them. Question, read Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 to 19. How are the entities that appear on the fourth day described... And what are their functions? Genesis 1, beginning at verse 14. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the night from the day, and let let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. The terms sun and moon were surely avoided because their names in Hebrew were the names or closely related to the names of the sun and moon gods of the ancient Near East and Egypt. The use of the terms greater light and lesser light showed that they were created for specific functions, for signs and seasons and for days and years, and to give light on the earth, as we saw in verses 14 and 15. That is, the text shows very clearly that the sun and moon were not gods, but created objects with specific natural functions, much as we understand them today. Question. Read Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and verses 18 to 24. How is God intimately involved in the creation of Adam and Eve? Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. And Genesis 2, beginning at verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman, and brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. 
Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The ancient Near Eastern myths unanimously depict man's creation as an afterthought, resulting from an attempt to relieve the gods of hard labour. This mythical notion is contradicted by the biblical idea that man is to rule the world as God's vice-regent. Nothing in the creation of humans was an afterthought. If anything, the text points to them as the climax of the creation account, showing even more starkly how different the pagan and biblical accounts really are. Genesis thus presents a corrective against the myths of the ancient world. Moses used certain terms and ideas incompatible with pagan concepts, and he did this by simply expressing the biblical understanding of reality and of God's role and purpose in creation. So to finish the day, thousands of years ago, the biblical creation story was at odds with the prevailing culture. Today, the biblical creation story is at odds with the prevailing culture. Why shouldn't we be surprised? Wednesday, May 27, Creation and Time Question. Read Genesis chapter 5 and Genesis 11. How does the Bible trace the history of humanity from Adam to Noah and from Noah to Abraham? Genesis 5, beginning at verse 1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and blessed them, and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived one hundred and thirty years, and begot a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were eight hundred years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years, and he died. Seth lived one hundred and five years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived eight hundred and seven years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were nine hundred and twelve years, and he died. Enosh lived ninety years and begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. After he begot Mahalalel, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Mahalalel lived sixty-five years and begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mahalalel lived eight hundred and thirty years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalel were eight hundred and ninety-five years, and he died. Jared lived one hundred and sixty-two years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived eight hundred years and had sons and daughters, so all the days of Jared were nine hundred and sixty-two years, and he died. Enoch lived sixty-five years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God three hundred years and had sons and daughters, so all the days of Enoch were three hundred and sixty-five years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not for God took him. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands, because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. 
So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Genesis chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar, And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. This is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begot Arphaxed two years after the flood. After he begot Arphaxed, Shem lived 500 years and begot sons and daughters. Arphaxed lived 35 years and begot Salah. After he begot Salah, Arphaxed lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. Salah lived thirty years and begot Eber. After he begot Eber, Salah lived four hundred and three years and begot sons and daughters. Eber lived thirty-four years and begot Peleg. After he begot Peleg, Eber lived two sorry four hundred and thirty years and begot sons and daughters. Peleg lived thirty years and begot Reu. After he begot Reu. Peleg lived 209 years and begot sons and daughters. Reu lived 32 years and begot Serug. After he begot Serug, Ru lived 207 years and begot sons and daughters. Serug lived 30 years and begot Nahor. After he begot Nahor, Serug lived 200 years and begot sons and daughters. Nahor lived 29 years and begot Terah. After he begot Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and begot sons and daughters. Now, Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishka. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son's Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. There is one element that makes these genealogies unique in the Bible. They contain the element of time, causing some scholars to correctly call them chronogenealogies. They contain an interlocking mechanism of descent information coupled with spans of time, so that when person 1 had lived X years, he fathered person 2, and person 1, after he fathered person 2, lived at Y years, and he fathered other sons and daughters. Genesis 5 adds the formula phrase, and all the days of the person 1 were Z years. This interlocking system would have precluded deleting certain generations or adding them. 
Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 contain a continuous line of descent as corroborated by 1 Chronicles 1 verses 18 to 27 in which there are no added or missing generations. Let's look at that. 1 Chronicles 1 beginning at verse 18. Now Faxad begat Shela, and Shela begat Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan begat Elmodad, Shelef, Hazam Aveth, Jera, Hadaram, Uzal, Dekla, Ebal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophah, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan, Shem, Afaxed, Shela, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Serug, Nahor, Terah, and Abram, who is Abraham. In this way, the Bible interprets itself. For nearly 2,000 years, Jewish and Christian expositors have interpreted these texts to represent history and an accurate way to determine the date of the flood and the age of the earth at least from the seven days of creation as depicted in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. In recent decades, there have been attempts to reinterpret Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 to accommodate longer ages, as some archaeological and historical data are interpreted by fallible human beings to suggest. This raises serious questions about the reliability of the Bible record. But... If we are to understand God's concept of time and its progression through history, we must recognize that these two chapters are, as Gerhard F. Hazel writes in The Meaning of the Chronogenealogies of Genesis 5 and 11, published in Origins in 1980, page 69, both historical and theological linking Adam with the rest of humankind and God with man in the realm of the reaches of space and time. Genesis 5 and 11 verses 10 to 26 provide the time framework and human chain that link God's people with the man whom God created as the climax of the six-day creation event of this planet. And so to finish today, though these texts in the Old Testament are there for good and important reasons, what does Paul say in 1 Timothy 1.4 and Titus 3.9 that we need to heed when talking about such texts? 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 4 Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. And Titus two, uh, 3 verse 9 but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and striving after the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Thursday, May 28, Creation in Scripture Question, read the following texts and write down how each writer referenced Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 11. Matthew 19, verse 4 to 5 And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? And Mark 10, verses 6 to 9 But from the beginning of the creation God made them male and female. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And Luke 11, verses 50 and 51. That the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. And John 1, 
verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And Acts 14, verse 15, And saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. Romans 1, 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. Ephesians 3, verse 9, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2, verses 12 to 15, And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with self-control. And James 3, verse 9, With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, Who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Revelation 2, verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 3, Verse 14, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And Revelation 22, verses 2 and 3, In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And Jude 11, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the errors of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. And Jude 14, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints. Jesus and all of the New Testament writers refer to Genesis 1 to 11 as reliable history. Jesus refers to Moses' writings and the creation of male and female in Matthew 19 verse 4. Paul often uses the creation account to substantiate the theological points he makes in his epistles. He declared to the learned men of Athens, The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Acts 17.24 In these ways, the New Testament writers built on the foundational nature of Genesis to show the modern reader the significance of this literal event. Read Romans chapter 5. More than half a dozen times, Paul makes a link from Adam to Jesus. That is, he assumes the literal existence of a historical Adam, a position that becomes fatally compromised when an evolutionary model of origins replaces a literal reading of the texts. Let's read Romans chapter 5. 
Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having been now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, and much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, Just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offence. For if by the one man's offence many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offence resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offences resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offence death reign through one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offence judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For, As by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so to finish today. In the New Testament writers, inspired by the Holy Spirit and Jesus himself, viewed the creation account as reliable history. Why would it be foolish for us, based on the claims of fallen, fallible human beings, not to do the same? Friday, May 29. From the book Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 25, we read, The Bible is the most comprehensive and the most instructive history which men possess. It came fresh from the fountain of eternal truth, and a divine hand has preserved its purity through all the ages. Here only can we find a history of our race, unsullied by human prejudice or human Pride, end of quote. And from the same author, Spiritual Gifts, Book 3, page 93. I have been shown that without Bible history, geology can prove nothing. Relics found in the earth do give evidence of a state of things differing in many respects from the present. But the time of their existence, and how long a period these things have been in the earth, are only to be understood by Bible history. 
It may be innocent to conjecture beyond Bible history if our suppositions do not contradict the facts found in the sacred scriptures. But when men leave the word of God in regard to the history of creation and seek to account for God's creative works upon natural principles, they are upon a boundless ocean of uncertainty. Just how God accomplished the work of creation in six literal days, he has never revealed to mortals. His creative works are just as incomprehensible as his existence. And that brings us to our two large discussion questions for today. One, what scientific explanations about present reality, what can be handled, heard, seen, tested and retested, are filled with debate and controversy? Why do so many people unquestionably accept every scientific proclamation about events that supposedly occurred millions or even billions of years ago? 2. Modern science works on the assumption, a reasonable one on the face of it, that you cannot use supernatural means to explain natural events. That is, you can't try to explain, for instance, a famine by claiming that a witch put a curse on the land. However, what are the limitations of this approach when it comes to the creation account as depicted in Genesis? In other words, the Genesis account was a purely supernatural event. If, however, you automatically rule out the supernatural as the means of creation, then why will any other model you come up with of necessity be wrong? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Missionary Asks Why by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Leif Hongisto couldn't understand why he was heading home to Finland after serving for nine years as president of Middle East University in Beirut, Lebanon. He loved the Seventh-day Adventist University, the Mediterranean climate and the freshly made hummus. Most important, he felt that he hadn't realised his full vision for the university and the decision to go home caught him by surprise. I was rather confused about why God was leading my life away from something that had become my whole life and was very close to my heart, he said. With many prayers and heavy hearts, he and his wife packed their suitcases, filled up boxes and flew to Finland. As part of the process for missionaries returning home, Hongisto had to undergo a medical examination at the hospital. During the routine procedure, the doctor detected slightly raised PSA levels in Hongisto's blood, a possible sign of prostate cancer. Have you had any health complications? the doctor asked. Hongisto shook his head. I feel great, he said. However, the doctor ordered a follow-up test. A couple of months later, the PSA levels had risen even more, and the now worried doctor called for additional tests and a biopsy. Soon, Hongisto was whisked away for a five-hour surgery, and the doctor removed a 3.5-ounce or 100-gram tumour. It turned out that a routine medical checkup detected an aggressive cancer growth, Hongisto said. I began to understand why God led me to back to Finland, where I would get very professional, up-to-date technology for treatment. Hongisto, 62, remains a missionary. He is in good health and serving as rector of Finland Junior College, a boarding academy and day school with about 185 students ages 6 to 18 in Pikio, a town in southwest Finland. Many students at the school, founded in 1918, come from non-Adventist families. Finland itself is a highly secular country and has only 4,800 Adventists in a population of 5.5 million. Reflecting on his 2018 move back to Finland, Hongisto has taken to heart the words of a speech that he gave at his first graduation ceremony at Finland Junior College in May 2018. He told the graduates, You think life is in front of you and you have a vision of what it will look like. None of that will come true. Life will turn out very differently. 
But when you give it to God, a life lived in faith will always be more exciting, significant and substantial than what you ever could have imagined. And there's a photograph, and I think it's his wife there with uh, Hongisto. That is true in my life, said Hongisto, pictured. Life definitely surprises me positively each new day and is definitely better than what I could have imagined. Finland is part of the Trans-European Division, which will receive the 13th Sabbath offering this quarter. This lesson was read by Dr Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.